Okay guys, I am down here on the beach. Gonna give it a go with the weirdest rig I could possibly dream up laying there at night. I'm trying to think of what type of rig I can have. And you can see I'm on the beach. Flat calm. Not great tides. It is what it is with the winds down. Kind of everything. By these huge massive boulders here. And this is my rig. This is the GP totally awesome catch everything rig or blank or die trying. So this is the rig, right. I'm not even sure how best to describe this. Let's pull it up a bit higher. Right, at the bottom is one of Tony's Wackenoster rigs here. I've got a bait up with ragworm. I've got, just been and bought some fresh ragworm. Hooks are very close together. So the idea being, the lead lays on the bottom. Okay, and then from here, about two feet off the bottom, I've got, wait for this, I've got a squid jig. But surely you would think that would just lay on the bottom as well. So I'm hoping that this 42 gram weight sea tech, is that 42 grams? If, if so, 40. So I've got two grams to play with. Buoyancy on this float, right? I'm aiming that that will come up off the bottom. So down there, there's going to be the seabed. With my baits on the bottom, I'm going to slack off rather than wind up tight. And I'm hoping this squid jig is going to hang two feet off the seabed. All I'll do is go through the ring once, wrap it a couple of times around the body there, and just put it through the spikes. I haven't tied it or anything. Up here, I've got, you can see that, a um, sequin bead there, a stop knot, and this, as I say, Sea Tech buoyant float, which I'm hoping will lift that jig just off the bottom. I've no idea whether it's going to work, but I'm figuring if the squid come around and get, you know, any attraction off of here, they might, might grab this. I'm also going to put on here a light stick. No point putting it on yet because I've got a couple of three hours of, uh, of daylight left. It's about an hour up from high water and it's going to be ebbing all the time. So by the time it reaches low water, it's going to be pretty poor for me. It's going to be low water, which is not what I wanted. But listen, a day on the beach is better than a day working at home. So, bait this one up and uh, heave it out and see what happens. Got some giant big worms here which I won't be putting on hold, otherwise I'll be running out. They've got plenty of beads, little luminous beads here, and these hooks are offset as well. So I'm going to be using sections of uh, worms, just to see what's out there. Just like this, I've got to pop it over. I can snap that one off and I can go on the next hook here. All these hooks are close together. Very, very sharp hooks. It's just an experiment. I'm laying in bed at night thinking, what if, what if, what if, you know? There we go. Probably going to plough through these before I uh, really get a chance to get to darkness. So I've got, a, I think, uh, some bluey, frozen bluey I'm going to be using as well. Half a worm. Cover those over. That should be enough. And heave it out into the wild blue yonder. I'm not going to go far with it. There, as you can see, is the rig. The most bizarre rig you could probably want to see. And a booty. Right, let's move. Let's move along a little bit. Heave that out. Goes. The float has actually worked. I can see it. It's been stopped by the stop knot, but instead of tightening up, I'm going to leave it pretty slack. Now, obviously, because I'm not retrieving, because I'm not retrieving the uh, lure as you would do normally, I'm banking on just seeing a bite there. So the slightest bang I get on that, I'm going to wind in anyway because if the squid's gonna fla flash around and might get off, as if I get a squid take at all. Probably more chance in the hours of darkness. Second rig is the standard pulley panel rig, got two hooks on this one. And I've got on there, I believe is a section of bluey. You can see with the two hooks on there and a grip lead. I'll just clip this one up. So he's like that and then uh, whiz him out there. Uh, there could be one big fish out there, who knows? 
who knows the seat. I think I'm going to whack it from this side. Without catching the tripod. That's disengaged anyway, it's not a problem, so at least I know it's clear. It's going to take a while to uh, thaw out. It's pretty well frozen. And that one can stay out there for a good hour or more. You never know. Strange things out at sea. So this one, as you can see, I'm tied up to the uh, to the grip lead there. You see a slight bend in the rudder hold. The camera's still there. And I've got just a little bit of give there in case anything monstrous comes along, which it never does. And this one is slack there. It's just hanging the float, should be supporting that jig. So I've got the bonus, hopefully, of catching something on the uh, on the seabed or maybe getting a squid take further up as usual I'm going to throw out the uh, spinning rod three hooks on it and uh, just throw some worms in really close probably just want a bomb lead here because the tide's going to want to pull the other way after a couple of hours um, so I'm getting to the top of the tide now so this rig you can see here is just a small about a three ounce grip lead and then three small uh, short snoods, relatively short, or close together I should say, and just to show you here, the rig, it's got beads down here and this crimp is only lightly crimped, I've slid it down as a sort of worm stop there, and you can clip this down because there are clips there for doing that just there, but I'm not going to bother with that, I like to just lob it out there and make sure that those have released, I'm sure they will, I'm sure they will, but I don't trust them, let's get this one out there. Fishing this one just in the uh, shotgun rig holder there, which is just for messing about, you know, with small hooks. Just a sort of bonus. Make sure that drag comes off. Just tighten up to it. And it's inside the other rods, and as you can see, all it is a piece of uh, waste, sink waste tube. Same old story, make sure there's some weight on the back of the, of the tripod like this. In case you do get a big one. Come up and grab it. And there we go, I'm all set. Got about an hour to high water, and I'm hoping the ebb might be productive for me. I think it's time for a sandwich. I'd love to see my experimental float, stroke, squid, stroke, everything rig tap away. Maybe when it gets dark. I feel the tide is on the, uh, on the turn now, giving a few sort of swirly bits around the end of the groins and the markers there. And what I have got, I've got some raglan that I've frozen down with salt before. Now previously to this, I've never been able to do any good with them. But by putting a heavy duty coat and a salt in there, look, and freezing them down, these will definitely top me up with the ones I've got fresh. I would soon have fresh every time. And I just roll and wrap them individually. And especially boat fishing, there's just enough. If you if you put them all to one together in one big gobby bunch, they go too soft. But individually with a load of salt, that's given me some uh, spare baits here. And if I don't use them, they can go back in a freezer. Nothing wrong with that one. And that's probably two or three months old. But wrap them individually, put them in salt, get one of these little sandwich boxes. And that way, if you can't get any worm, buy any worm, dig any worm, and you've got some in the freezer, they might still work.
See, you know me with experimentation, I can't help it. Most nights, I suppose, I'm either armed with something in my mind because I've watched so many shooting films or something on TV, action hero stuff, or it's the news, doom and gloom, or it's fishing rigs. And recently it was fishing rigs, and that's why I came up with the idea of this one, because as I'm doing this, nearly December, um, it's squid time on the south coast of England. And they say there's not many squid out there, but there's some real big ones, you know, some people have huge squid ones, you know, not buckets and buckets of them. But I just got thinking about it. I thought, well, we've had no rain, so the water's going to be clear. The other thing is, the sea's calm. We haven't had a lot of wind, so the water's clear. So the squid, one hopes, is, is a visual hunter. My best chance of catching one, I figure, you know, might be down here, just here on the south coast. It's not very really deep water, but they must hunt up and down this beach. And years ago, three, four years ago, I can remember, I think I put it up in a film, how I was getting V-notches chewed out of pouting and whiting that I had, that had hooked up and just stayed out there um, before I wound them in. And so I'm figuring they might be coming in close, and they might be the smaller species of squid like this. But by suspending that squid jig, you know, just this far off the seabed, hopefully by the flow, then it might actually get a hookup. Who knows? Probably find out more when it gets dark. One thing I didn't do was charge the old phone up at my age, fishing into the night in the cold in the winter. Perhaps not a good idea because you might want it for emergencies and down here you have to also consider behind this, will I get a signal? But by pure chance, back in the car, I always leave it charged up on these little charger packs. So I'm hoping there's enough left in here just to actually charge the phone back up. And of course, I might want to contact my wife and tell her what an enormous fish I haven't caught. If I leave that, hopefully that'll charge up. It's just something to bear in mind, guys, safety. Not necessarily if you're an old guy like me. It could be anybody that's fishing alone. You know, if there's no way of charging your phone up, take one of these little miniature power pack things and you get two or three charges out of it. I'm not one to Facebook, Instagram, scroll, scroll. No, I'm not doing any trolling. I'm not doing it. Most of the time I switch it off to say battery. But I have been texting a bit and I've used uh, quite a bit of battery. So mine mostly goes switched off because I don't want grief and aggravation. But just a tip, especially rock fishing, make sure you've got a, a signal you can't make the signal obviously but make sure you've got enough on the phone in case something bizarre happens you slip you might not necessarily fall down crack heel or break an ankle you might just strain the back or you might strain a leg or a knee twist it and you can't, can't climb back up so it's just sort of safety thing i just could plug some fish in ah. well as you can see i've had to put the shell trap the tide's dropping away now, no bites at all. I think I've got about an hour and a half till it gets dark. I'm getting cold. I had this chest thing for about two weeks now. And I don't want to get really get it down in my lungs too cold, so I'm going to put this up. It just basically stops the air movement. Which is, I can't tell you, even in here, <laughs> it ain't warm. Trust me, it's not warm. But it's just not as cold as the slight air movement out there, which will chill me and drop my body core temperature. So that's why I bought this. It's not going to rain, there's no big winds, it's just that air movement coming from the north, coming from up in the Arctic and down over wherever Sweden stuff. It's cold, cold, like a dry cold. So that's why this is up. And really basically I'm just sitting here waiting until it gets dark. So and it's like it might be my only chance of getting anything. And I want to save it dark to see if I can get a squid on that rig. And in a minute, about say four o'clock, just before four, I'm going to crack one of my night sticks and I'm going to try and bind that above the squid as an extra bonus enticement. The enticement I've got at the moment is I'm going to have some uh, tea and cakes. Can't beat flask tea. Almost rinse a car engine out with this stuff. Come on, let's see a bite. For goodness sake, I mean, no wonder I'm the only angler on two and a half miles of beach. I've looked down there with my long lens on this camera. There's absolutely not one person fishing and kicking. You can see why, can't you? One pie. It's given me one pie the way. 
Yeah, that's how much you eat when you get cold. That looked like a nibble. When you get cold, I was going to say you're not having any bites. That looked like a little tap. Not bath tap, more sort of kitchen tap. Wow, the light's just starting to fade, guys. Can't see from this lens, it looks like daylight. So I float my stop, and the final piece of the jigsaw, the final piece of the trap is set. There you go. If you can see that, and there's a Silume light stick there. I've just tied it on with some bait thread. The floats up here should hold it up like this. There's the jig underneath. The squid comes up. He sees this light, sees this, which does hold a little bit of light if I charge it up. And then, in fact, I've, I can't switch it off. But I'll show you, hopefully, when it's dark, that this shows up light. Then the lead at the bottom with a three hook. So, to be honest, it's a bit of a conglomeration to cast out, but as yet, it hasn't tangled. Will, it, will this light stick or not? I don't know. But you can see, that's the sort of thing I lay in bed at night thinking about different rigs. I know if it's in deep water. I reckon it will work. Let's get it out there. Well, I've moved right down with the tide. The tide's dropped right back down, three quarters away, uh, out now. And over here, I am absolutely motionless. I've moved right down. I'm getting very, very small taps on the float one here. That one is there. Very small taps. Other than that, no white here, no nothing. Down here. Well, look, I've got to move the rods down again in a minute for the last sort of hour. It's gone way out again. Got a little bit of colour in it now, which is, uh, makes me feel I should be getting something, but you can see where I am back up here. Nothing, and I really thought I'd get something with a squid. This new patented squid rig it was in the experimental stage and looks like it's going to stay in the experimental stage. So I'm going to have one more move down. I'll probably leave them out for a bit and then uh, I've got some uh, soup. I might just have a cook up before I move. We've got here potato and leek soup. A good winter warmer, especially if the gas lasts long enough. So if I'm not having a really big uh, cook up, I tend to use nearly empty gas bottles, the ones that have really got a little bit in them. I'm going to make a cup of tea or something like that, or boiling soup because I know at the end of the day, if it does run out, it's not going to be the end of the world because the soup is at least going to be warm because they're pre-cooked in those cans. And you've got to heat them up for about 15, 20 minutes. But with this one, potato and leek, because I've got a big piece of potato in there, it takes a while to get the heat through the potato. I found that out to my cost. But this is something what you want, a, a good thick soup, you know, to keep you warm through the cold winter evenings. I'm going to give it another hour after this. I'm at the worst time, I know I am, but what do you do? There's no wind, it's good for sound, it's good for casting, it's good for everything, except the fish. Good for soup. The thing is, I could see that method would actually work, because I'm suspending, there's my bait on the bottom, so I could catch something on those anyway, but I'm suspending the squid, you know, the squid jig about two feet off the bottom, and then just above that, 
is the light, you know, the silene light to attract the squid to it. So sure, they might attack the actual light itself, but they're within six inches of the jig. So surely they're gonna see the jig and grab it. And if they try and back down, the floats holding it up, I should get hammering by. I must try it down somewhere like Weymouth because I feel it's something you could do. You can have baits on the bottom at the same time as having a squid jig and possibly catching a squid. Look, it might be, I'm on the worst tide, it's, it's shallow, it's, it's low tide, there's no full moon to bring the squid in. Um, it's all sort of against me, but it's still an experiment. It's just, if, if people didn't experiment, then they wouldn't know the good methods that are productive now, would they? Somebody, at some stage, must have had blank after blank after blank, experimented with fishing, and suddenly gone, oh, this method works for the bass, or the conger, or whatever. Indeed, freshwater as well, and that's the way it is about learning. So. I have no problem, look, I don't enjoy having a blank, of course I don't. It's a beautiful evening though, a bit cold. But supposing I did catch squid, and then another squid, and another squid, it could be a whole new method there. But I feel more deeper water, full moon, high tide, that's what I think, and dark. Well, Graham, you wouldn't get full moon during the daytime, would you? No, that's true. The soup's just about ready now. Wow. That's a real moustache melt to that one. Let's take it off. Let that cool down. That is steamy. And of course, I get really cold hands. I can use the last of this bottle on low to warm all my hands up. So I don't waste anything. I've seen people throw half full bottles away because it's not quite powerful enough. Or that won't be happening with me. Well, that's cooling off a bit. I just could check those rods. And there is indeed nothing happening whatsoever. I'm kind of amazed. Well, frankly, I am amazed that there's no whiting out there. The other benefit is you can put the hot saucepan on your legs, warm your legs up, warm your hands up as well. There's a lot to be said for the residual heat of a saucepan. There we go. Steamy hot sauce. was either a man with a very, very big head torch over that rise of shingle over there, or the moon's coming up. And if the moon's coming up, do you know what? I think I'm gonna hang on a little bit longer because that could be the switch to go to the bottom of the tide. Bottom of the tide is against me, but if the moon comes up, I'm gonna to have to text the wife and say, I'm gonna give it another hour. I've got to experiment. I've got to try this jig. And with the moon coming up, I feel the squid would be uh, perhaps on the move. That might be the switch. Well, folks, it is definitely, most definitely, the B word. Yeah, blank. The experimental, submer semi-submersible, um, isotope, sirloom light stick, squid jig, float fishing rig is still in the experimental stage, but I feel some of you guys might get some ideas as well, and it might even work. In fact, I know it'll work in, in deeper water. But the one thing is, at least I told you there's a blank. There's not many, there's quite a few YouTubers out there making fishing programs now. I haven't seen anybody doing a YouTube about having a blank, but with me, you get the real deal, you get the blank, and that's what happens. There's no point in me going, oh, look at my fat carp, I've got a 50 pound pike, or 23 pound bass. And, yeah, okay, fine, that's okay, but most people don't catch big fish. I mean, I would say most people are, are pleased to catch any fish. Tonight, I'll be pleased to catch any fish. It ain't happening, it's the way it is. I've got to take it on the chewing, go home, go to bed, and try and think if I can adjust that rig. So, don't go away, folks. 
So now I'm in a furious rage, even though I've got to drive home, and I'm going back in the workshop tomorrow, and I'm going to bash the hell out of something. Stay tuned, and you'll find out what it is I'm going to bash the hell out of. No, it's not the wife, for goodness sake. She'd be bashing the hell out of me, because I'm two hours late. Well, I've got a few jobs to, uh, to do in here. Wow. It's going to freeze big time tonight. <laughs> it's blazing through there, the sun. Clear sky. I was going to go beach fishing tomorrow, and I was also going to go pike fishing down the Hampshire Raven. I don't know what to do, you know, it's just, it's just weird. But let's get these jobs out of the way. So the first one involves lures. Now, the bit of beach fishing and rock fishing I've done, I've noticed some of the paints come off from my sort of mackerel lures. You can see them there. And it, I, look, I can bend these so you can put a shape in them as well. So that, I think was like a green one, as you can see, it is now nothing. <laughs> and this one was a, a pink or red back, that's nothing. And I'm a great believer in just, you know, plain colours. So all I'm going to do with those is dip those straight into a pot of white gloss paint. I, I don't see any reason to paint them. You know, you can get a small brush. You can also hook your thumb like I've done. Get off of there. I've got a take and I'm not even fishing. You can uh, dip them whole or you can get a brush and paint them. But I just want to dip them and, uh, you know, I'm probably going to lose them anyway. Now this is just... To the best of my knowledge, radiator paint. So I'm going to just give them a good old swish around in this. As you can see, I can get them all covered. Go around. I'm going to turn them any other way. There we go. I'm not really bothered about what it looks like. I just want a white lure. Because I know at the end of the day, this will probably all just come off again anyway. And I'm just going to stick it up here, let it drip off, and then I've just got to put the little nail through the hole there to redo the hole. And down here, there you can see, any drips, a piece of cloth. So how easy is this? Of course, I'm going to use a brush in a minute, but I'm just saying if I had a really big pot of paint, it'd be no problem just dip them all straight in and job done. That's all I'm doing. There we go. And I'm figuring like the radiator paint, it's not like enamel, but it, uh, one assumes it's a nice hard finish to it. If I want to put an eye on it, I can do. And you can also do your lead weights like this, if you want lead weights. I've done that before, let me show you. But you can if you want. You can, you can, you can paint them, of course you can paint them with brushes, but I'm just using this because it's quick. How quick is this? Wipe off the surplus. Now I can tie them up, if you want to use a brush, you've got to do all the brush cleaning this way, I'll just leave it, pin it up like this, let it, let it drip down on there, and this might, being white, attract something during daylight for fishing. Or you can put it in a vise. So you can see there's the actual mackerel lures there, and there's some weights, I could do a row of those along there, any surplus just drips down here. Now while I've got the paint pot out, I am going to get a brush, and just show you what I'm going to do. You don't have to do this, of course. So, been sorting through all my marlin lures, tuna lures, wahoo lures. This is for guys who go farm fishing. Now, I've found over the years, just by painting the hooks white, that you can keep these, they last a long time. Because I've got, let's just say here, this one is a mold craft, I think it's a soft head, with plenty of marlin on it. The, the hooks are on a spring ring system. I mainly just mentioned this, you can do it with shark hooks. There's a piece of 18 SWG wire in between there, because I like the spring rig like this, so it's, it springs back with a pair of hooks, rather than just have them loose. And of course they're taped. Now if I peel that off of there, they will be clean underneath. But what you might want to do is just give these a coat of paint because you can always cut the paint off when, you know, if you're not using these from year after year, you might just want to preserve the hooks a bit more. So I'll try and pull the lure away a bit so I've got the hooks clear there, as you can see. Touch them off with a bit of sandpaper, which I've done. And just around this area, 
down there, right over the point. It doesn't matter because when I file it, when I want to use them, they're going to be nice and sharp and because I can cut that paint off with a file. And the rest is going to be fine. I have no problem with them being white. I've done this for years. I used to do a lot of marlin fishing. I come back from a trip and during the summer, because I didn't marlin fish much during the summer, it's mostly a winter thing. I would just give them a coat of paint like this. You could do it with shark hooks as well. And of course, these can be hung up as well, just rest them on the hook point. But you might want a second nail like that, just to keep the lure, you don't want the paint dripping over the lure. So if you can see there, I don't know if I've got one that I've finished or not. Probably not. It's called a clone lure, good for striped marlin. Again, being used loads. It's crimped in here. I've given it a bit of a rub down. And it's just a single hook this time. And you could do it with shark hooks. I mean, most British people, if they're doing shark fishing, they don't go very often, do you? You know, it's not like we do it every month of the year. It's generally, summer, spring, summer, autumn type of thing. But you give all your hooks a little coat of paint or whatever you want. That's what I just do it with mine. That's all I do it with mine. Look, I'm not bothered about getting paint everywhere because when I sharpen them, I'm going to be taking that bit of paint off. So this way I can do all my marlin lures, get them all hooked up here out of the way, and then they can go away for whatever, a year, two years, doesn't make any difference, and either this hook's going to be good. Okay, I've been through the lure box. Here's one that's been at least, at least six years painted up. Look there, it's all been painted, the paint's still okay, and all I do is just, if you can see this, get yourself a decent file, the point will still be there that you left on it, but you've just got to scrape off that surplus of paint. And this is just my way of doing it. Mostly for marlin, but you can do it with all your big, big hooks if you want. There we go. That's as sharp. That's, that one there is as sharp as you would ever, ouch, as you ever want it. But if I was putting that away, a coat of white paint over that, and then basically all I do is a few strokes of the file next year, year after, whenever I'm going to use it, take off the point and the rest is ready to go. Just a little tip. This was a good lure, it's a fast speed one and it actually has a revolving head there. So with the prisms inside, it throws out a lot of light, flashes as it were, flashes I'm going to call that as it goes through the water. It's on 400 double crimp stainless steel thimble and uh, no wire in the back of this one, just taped on straight and double crimped in there. Just another tip for you. Now then, moving on. Who knows what this is? It's a very, very old scraper, but of course I've got others. But look, these are absolutely wimpy, horrible things, which I do use. This one, I can't even uh, bend. Now the handle split off there, but it's got two pinholes, if you can see that there. So I'm going to try and find a piece of cherry wood in two halves as this was and shape it and see if I can make a grip there because this is such a handy one. And I don't know how far these go up inside, possibly just slotted in there like that. Whereas this is the full lead. That's one piece of steel there. And it's really, really good one. I should say it's Ed Warden's probably a hundred and something years old. I've used it and used it and used it. And now's the time to try and give it another bit of a tart up and uh, a refurb. Let's get out and see if I can find a piece of cherry wood. I'll keep all different types of wood under here, leftover wood, oak, only a bit of ash. This is cherry wood, I know, but I only want, looking at the width of that handle, quite a small piece. It might even do it. This one there. Always keep bits and pieces of wood. You don't know when you want them. Worst case scenario, they can go on the log burner. But I'm thinking maybe that handle is just about right. Unless I've got a short of these. No. I've got oak as well. Right, 
I think that's a bit too short that piece so let's whack this into two sections get two out of that I'm going to come back there and I don't throw any of this away because I might want something to make who knows a teaspoon handle now I'm going to peel this off I'm just going to run that bark off of there hopefully he says on the Stanley knife or what they call a box cutter hopefully you guys are seeing it it's almost bushcraft isn't it almost bushcraft see if we can just lift that bark there we go now I can work at this with a old school knife, which is a round one and less sharp. There we go. This is all seasoned. This is about two years old, this stuff. So it should come off pretty well. And just roll the knife. Always be careful with knives. This one is a purpose, purposely kept blunt knife with the round tip on it. <clears throat> Again, probably 100 years old, 80 years old. And the saying is, you're more likely to cut yourself with a blunt knife than a sharp knife. So beware of all knives. I've got a knot here which I'm trying to get round. That's the only good thing. I'm not a lover of the winter. I hate it at all, but at least it does get me out in the garage doing jobs. That I wouldn't be doing if I was fishing. Let's take that last piece off there. In fact, I'm going to put that in the in the rice for safety's sake. And I think I'll whiz that off with the chisel. That's uh, really what we got. <laughs> This is quite a nice piece of wood to work with anyway. I think I'm going to split that down the middle and give me two semicircles. So for that I'm just going to put, I could saw it I suppose. Just mark that so I know which is uh, the top and the bottom. Smooth this off. That's just going to measure the uh, length of the handle because there is actually just here a little lip and there's obviously a lip there so I want to come up against that I'm going to draw around there hmm jigsaw maybe I think on that one Okay, so I'm now going to take about that much off the outside edge. Alright, so split that down there. I'm going to use that and I could probably use that piece of wood to tap that all the way through. There's our two bits. 
one will be a uh, sort of semicircle because that's a natural curve of the wood and the other one I've got to again mark so I know which are the top ends so that one's going to have an edge rounded to it and I can take that off even with this uh, blade it doesn't have to be rounded it's just aesthetically breezy and I know when I had it I think it was my grandfather's it was indeed rounded and worn partially obviously because it had been used a lot that's why the edge was rounded take care of these any sharp knives a lot of common sense don't over pressure anything I'll just let the blade do the job that's about right you just adjust all the time Now I could use my bushcraft knife for this I suppose but these blades are so sharp I just feel they do the job a lot quicker. Right the rest I can either do, now some people would do it this way right they would do it this way wouldn't they sharpening but the other way you can do it is actually put in the, the tool in the vise like this and then just work in a way but watch your fingers. A lot of people like working like this. Obviously this is fiddly. Not much more junk. That's what people take my word, just don't throw anything away. The minute you throw it away, like this, like this, this stuff. minute you throw it away you're going to want a piece obviously this, this blunts my scissors but I do have scissors sharpened up there so that's better it's a really cool screen sandpaper this one so as you can see I've got one half that fits snugly there the other half fishy, it fits fishes. That's it. As long as I'm under that little lip there, there. So all that remains for me to do is drill two holes through there because here are the pinholes. Three pinholes there. I could put a screw in there or I could put something like a one inch nail. I feel like I want to take that front edge down a little bit there. Take one of the, I've rounded the front edge there, get it located in that. If you guys can just see in there, let's get this rubbish out of it. I think this is actually a putty knife because this seems as though it's hard putty in there. Like that. That's better. Keep it dead equal distance and I'm going to mark these holes with a I call this a gimlet or a bradle. What's the difference? I think one has a thread on it. All you carpenter DIYers. What is the difference between a gimlet and a bradle? Yeah, I can see those marks. Now I'm going to drill those out. Oh, I need these busted old stuff. No luxury tools for me on the road. That looks about right. Check that. Oh, look at that. It's a good try. It's the smallest drill I've got. How lucky was that? Because that's on a taper, it doesn't pinch, pinch in the vise too well because it's tapered. Don't push too hard. There we go. So I've got like a one inch nail. Yes, one. 
two, three, so all those holes line up. So all it remains for me to do is put this on the other side and continue those holes so they line up. Trouble is in the cold weather like this, a lot of the glues go really stiff and obviously got no heating out here in the workshop so I just pull it out on either a nail or something this might just help and it's, and it's a sort of spacer it's a spacer as well that's that one bit on the other side well I've let it glue in there while I went over Cup of rosy, cup of rosy Lee. So that's just going to hold it a bit. And then what I intend doing is just folding those nails over, crushing them first with a big, big hammer. Get the head on there. Just bend those over. They're all smooth, they're all buried. And I can get the uh, angled one here. It's an old railway sleeper one, this I think. I just give that an extra pinch there. These are all smooth. That's it. Get rid of any dirty sort of finger marks that might go with the glue on there. The nails are buried right inside. Now all that remains to be done now as you can see from that I think I'll give that uh, a bit of a, a coat of linseed oil this one's a boiled linseed oil so they tell me it doesn't go as tacky as the uh, standard one just to finish it off now this is going to last forever to be honest because the steel is really good quality the steel there and the oil will help keep the the cherry wood of the handle in good nick. And every time I do say one of my axe handles with some linseed oil, I can always give a little bit to the uh, tool as well. Wipe the surplus off. There we go, people. I think you'll agree. There's the old flexible cheapo tool which has been taped up and busted a few times. And there is some that's probably a hundred years old and is still going strong and now has a refurbed handle. Perfect. Because I can get in here, bang bang with a, with my palm of my hand, or indeed tap it with a hammer here like this. That's what it's, you know that's there for. Spread putty, chip things out, put an edge on that. A great tool. Now move on to another job well pleased with that